It's a learning experience. It's not the same thing as a, a rental. You are starting a hospitality business. It's almost more about the hospitality, your communication with the tenants and providing an experience for them than it is about just having a, a, a property. Welcome to the Rental Property Owner and Real Estate Investor Podcast, brought to you by the Rental Property Owner Association, providing benefits and services to real estate investors and rental property owners for over 48 years. With your host, Brian Hamrick from Hamrick Investment Group. This episode is sponsored by Green Property Management, managing everything from single family homes to apartment complexes in the West Michigan area. Find out more at greenpropertymgt.com. Hello and welcome to the RPOA, using Airbnb and short-term rentals as an investment strategy panel. We've got a great group of experts today, uh, experts and investors who will help us understand how short-term vacation rentals work, why they're such a great strategy for real estate investors, some of the pitfalls to be aware of, and how to do it right. Okay, I would like to start by introducing our panel here, <laughs> starting with Gary Hall down at the end. Uh, Gary is in the process of converting an old motel, a low-income 11 unit, into an Airbnb. Uh, six of those units are online already, and he also rents out a private room in his own home. Gary is also an entrepreneur, a passive income strategist, and the operations manager of West Shore Property Management, located in Muskegon, Michigan. Gary was also a guest on the podcast. Uh, you can hear him both on episode 89 and the Halloween episode. Who listened to the Halloween episode? Check that one out. It's very scary. <laughs> Real life ghost stories from, from investors. Frederick Kidd is, is our next expert on the panel. Uh, Frederick is a licensed realtor in Illinois, and he's been managing and operating short-term rentals for the past eight years. He personally owns and operates five short-term rentals in the West Michigan area and the Chicago metro market. He also provides full-service management of short-term rentals and rental properties through his company, Silver Lakes Property Management. Now, Silver Lakes Property Management is currently managing 20 short-term rentals for clients located in Benton Harbor, Grand Haven, Spring Lake, and Manistee, Michigan. Uh, Kim Post is here. Kim has 10 units in Cadillac, Michigan, plus a house that she is in the process of converting to short-term vacation rentals. Kim has been a real estate investor for over 30 years, and she is the owner of Post & Associates Appraisals and Next Door Properties, LLC. And you can hear Kim on episode number 28 of the podcast. Uh, Clay Powell is, is the one closest to me here. Uh, Clay is going to give us the perspective of someone who rents and stays in Airbnbs. So he will be representing the end user. Uh, what the end user expects and what they respond to. Clay is also the director of the RPOA, and he and his staff are largely responsible for this conference today. Uh, Clay has been on the podcast several times, including episode number six and number 72. So let's get started here. Gary, I, I want to start with you, and I'm wondering if you could just kind of set the stage for us and, and give us a, your a definition of what Airbnb and short-term vacation rentals are. A short-term vacation rental is any rental that is not going to be someone's uh, main, main and primary residence. So you can have monthly rentals, weekly rentals, or daily rentals. Airbnb came along after some of the other big name brands like VRBO, uh, trying to carve out a niche for the, the properties that don't match the standard vacation rental mold. Uh, everyone knows that there are properties in vacation areas and that those properties rent out for thousands of dollars a week. Uh, but there are a lot of other space in the real estate world, everything from tree houses to uh, houseboats, single family residences that someone lives in normally, but they're on vacation. So there's a lot of real estate that could be rented out that wasn't being rented out. So a group of guys that were uh, started renting out their couch in San Francisco, uh, put it online and created Airbnb. So it's a place where you can take any form of real estate and try and turn it into a little bit of income. Um, so before we move on to Frederick, tell us a little bit about what, how you're doing that. How are you utilizing that, that concept? Uh, so I've been in traditional rentals for a while and we bought this old motel 
And at the last RPOA conference, we actually had a speaker come and talk about Airbnb. And she mentioned that one of the advantages of going with a short-term rental is that the shorter someone stays in your property, typically the better they treat the property. And since this was a low-income environment, uh, a typical low-income tenant does not take care of your property, and that causes a lot of maintenance costs. So it got me really interested. So we started renting out a individual room in our house to get a feel for how it worked, and we loved the guests. It was a, it's a different type of clientele than what we've dealt with in the past. And falling in love with the process, we thought it would be a great idea for uh, the motel. And we immediately started upgrading, putting nicer finishes into our motel than we were planning on, uh, and then furnished it and got to start renting last year. And, and, and tell us a little bit of how that's working out for you, because you have six of your units online. Mm -hmm. uh, how is that going? It's a learning experience. Uh, it is, it's not the same thing as a, a rental you are starting a hospitality business. It's almost more about the hospitality, your communication with the tenants and providing an experience for them than it is about just having a, a, a property. You have to look at everything that you're putting into the property as their experience while they're there. Everything from making sure they have access to Netflix or some form of entertainment, guidebooks of the interesting things to do around town, uh, greeting them, communicating with them through the Airbnb software. It, you're you're providing a, a resort experience in your house or in a, a small property close to you. Frederick, let, let's, uh, let, let's have you kind of fill in some of the blanks. Now, you, you not only own some Airbnbs mm -hmm. uh, or vacation rentals, but you also manage them for other people as well. I do. Uh, as do you, Gary. I, we can talk about that. Uh, can you tell us, like, why would Air, the short-term vacation rental Airbnb concept be appropriate for some people? Um, why should they consider doing it? Money. <laughs> uh, money, pure and simple. Um, and Gary really touched on, on this a moment ago with that, you know, your short-term people, when they come in, um, just as we as owners are very concerned about our ratings, um, so are travelers especially ones that who want to use Airbnb and, and do it so very often because I'm sure Gary can attest too, if you get someone to come in and, they, and their guest rating is a two, you're not gonna rent to them. Um, but you know, getting back to the whole money part, if you do it right, you're, the profits that you're making off your pro that your properties are substantially higher than what you could do from a traditional 12 month lease. Great. And um, t tell us a little bit about some of the, the people you manage. Well, actually, let me change the question. Sure. You, you said the word money. Yeah. Um, and, that, and why would anybody do this if not to make more money? So tell us about the money that the additional money that you can make by turning a property into a short term vacation rental. Well, I've got one two unit located uh, here in Michigan. Um, when I bought the property, I mean, it was performing fairly well. Um, I was grossing. It was a two-unit two apartment building. It was grossing about $1,600 a month. Within two years, I converted them both to Airbnb rentals. Um, and last year, that property grossed $72,000. So say that again, that you were getting how much? And now you're getting what? Well, well it's, uh, it's six, 12 times 16. So you're looking at a little over 10 grand. Um, and last year, it was 72000 So, wow. So you increased your income by a factor of seven. Yes in one year by converting to short-term rentals. Yes. Wow. Okay, so that's that's a pretty compelling reason then. Yeah. Uh, but, but it doesn't come without its pitfalls or work. You know, it took significant investment in the property to get it up to those standards, not just, you know, fixing the interior of the home, but the most important part um, is the furnishings of it. You know, if you want to come into a home, it's not like you're going to, your guests are going to be happy with grandma's you know 15 year old couch that you picked up for free you know your capital investment to provide that level of of income so what you can charge i mean it comes with a cost now you can do it you know within a reasonable budget but still at the same time you've got to prepare yourself to making that place as nice as you possibly can so in order to get that seven times return how much money did you have to put into the, to the, those properties or property to? Uh, to well, get I'm pretty cheap. Um, I would say 
between renovations and furnishings, I between fifteen and twenty five thousand per unit. Fifteen, say that. Again. Fifteen and twenty five thousand dollars per unit. Per unit, okay. Yeah. And how many units are we talking There's about? There's two units in that particular building. Okay, okay. So that's that's a pretty decent investment for a, yeah. a pretty good return. I, I mean, yeah. You're talking about uh, a repayment of your investment within about six months. Yeah. Now, Kim, we're, um, you're in the process of converting. Uh, a, a property to uh, short-term vacation rental. So you are in the investment phase. Why don't you tell us a little bit about that? Well, exactly for what Gary said, the properties I have are either low income, trashing the places, they're cabins, they were an old motel, you're you know, built in the 40s, they're up in Cadillac. And I, I purchased a project, which I knew it was, but I thought if I got the, ca the cabins fixed up, and rented them long term, they would be fine. But the, I'm just having a hard time getting tenants. Their efficiencies, which makes it um, even more difficult to get good tenants up there. So after talking to Gary and listening to the same speaker last year, I thought I would start with a couple of them. But as again, I, it's nice because there are several several that I can call on. Lots of podcasts right now and speakers that it would be much better for me to turn them into the Airbnb. And I was gonna do two and then add and add, but the more research I've done and learning from Gary is so review-based that I'm going to turn our properties are situated. So there's a north side and a south side. I'm gonna wait until I get the site in great shape and at least half of the cabins ready before I go online with it. And these are, these are more of a rustic, they're, they're a perfect hunting, fishing. We're like right on the snowmobile trail up there. We're a mile from the state park and a lake, and we're. Uh, it's much more going to be sports, sports people than um, business people is what I envision. Um, and I'm fortunate because the township I'm in is really promoting this right now. They're promoting tourism, and so. Um, that's that was the other worry is the zoning issue. But. Yeah, so so your your property is in Cadillac, Michigan, and it sounds like they are encouraging this type of uh, yes, they're very supportive, rental. very happy because it, it's there are a lot of these little old motels like Gary has or like I have cabins and they've turned into kind of halfway houses and it's been problems. So yeah, so. Not every community is as welcoming right. to they the short-term rentals, and, and hopefully yeah. we get to touch on that, too. You have to make sure you know uh, what the rules are in the community you're doing the Airbnb. Uh, Clay, let's uh, let's uh, go to you here. Now, you are an avid user of Airbnbs uh, and short-term rentals. Absolutely. Wife and I both, after I convinced her, it was a great experience. She's, she's joining me now, so it's been fun. So what, tell us about the experience. That well, my first from. experience was was kind of cool. I go to Indianapolis once in a while, do some research. So I was down that way, and I and I didn't really want to pay the two hundred fifty dollars a night to be close to where I wanted to be. You know, walking distance from the location. So I started looking on Airbnb for the first time, and I came across this young couple's high rise apartment. I thought, you know, I'll, I'll give this a shot. Um, it looked like the bed would probably hold me, <laughs> you know, <laughs> and it didn't look like it was too terrible. And it was a part of downtown Indianapolis I felt comfortable with, so um, I'll give it a shot. Um, so I, you know, it was 25 bucks a night. That's a little bit less than the 250 bucks wow. a night. Uh, I thought, well, it's worthwhile. And it was a secure building and they were gonna provide me with a parking space next to the building. So it all sounded wonderful. So I went there, um, got up, you know, security button, got up to the floor. They were there, they greeted me at the door and they said, oh, it's so great to see you. We've changed plans a little bit. And I'm like, oh, what's that gonna be? Well, we're not gonna be here. Hope that's okay. Well, it's okay with me. Um, if it's okay with you, right? So, yeah, and we're gonna let you sleep in our master bed bedroom because you know we're not gonna be here. We're gonna go camping, so you can just you know somebody will, somebody will come and lock the door after you leave when you're supposed to be gone. So that was my first experience. Um, the only thing I can say about that was kind of cool, or not, was uh, the fact that the guy had turtles in this master bedroom, <laughs> and they left the light on. And when I was going to bed, the light was on, and I couldn't decide whether I could turn it off or not. So I decided I had to leave it on because, you know, I didn't want to kill the 
poor turtles. So, <laughs> so then you get a so, rating. So all night I got this really bright light shining, but I didn't dink him on that one because I didn't like you say it's it's a it's a it's a it's an interesting relationship. You don't want to be the bad tenant. <laughs> And uh, you don't want to have to rate somebody bad because if you rate somebody bad, somebody doesn't want to rent to you, you know, either. Because oh, this guy's really picky, right? So it's an interesting dynamic. You have to decide. You don't want to go to some place where you feel like you might have to give them a bad rating, possibly. Um, but I've also stayed on the other end of it. Just recently in Louisville, a young couple bought a mixed-use building in the in near downtown Louisville in a kind of up-and-coming arts area. Louisville, Kentucky. Louisville, Kentucky. And that was a beautiful building. They remodeled the top to bottom, individual units. Um, I would consider them very upscale design. Obviously, they hired a very good designer. Beautiful place, all secure entry um, to, the, to access the building, and then another secure entry to get into the space. But I never saw them. It was all over the phone. Everything was great. They would give you a security passcode for that day. Um, and it was beautifully done. You had your own little parking spot. Um, so. It was as good as a hotel or better. I didn't have room service, but I didn't care. The space was beautiful. It was. It had a full kitchen. It had everything. So I could have stayed there for you know easily for a week. Or a month. I'd like to take a moment to tell you about Green Property Management. Not only do they manage everything from single-family homes to apartment complexes in the West Michigan area, they also manage my entire portfolio. So I can tell you from personal experience that their unique flat fee management style is worth a closer look. If you feel that your property isn't operating to its fullest potential, then Green Property Management can help you take a holistic approach that will save you money, eliminate your headaches, and increase your net income. And if you're a property Property manager interested in applying Green Property Management's model, give them a call at 1-866-95-GREEN or visit them on the web at greenpropertymgt.com. And how is the price compared to a hotel? That would, oh, half what that would have been still. I think at that time of year it was $125 a night mm -hmm. and it was much better than most hotels would be mm -hmm. in terms of the design and the layout. The bed was fabulous. I didn't even want to look at what kind of bed it was because I'd want to go home and buy one. <laughs> and my wife would look at me like I was crazy. <laughs> yeah, so it's been good. And we've had all kinds of experiences in between. Great. Um, uh, this gentleman here brought up management. You know, a lot of people who consider getting into Airbnb have to make the decision. Do I run it myself, do all the cleaning, take care of everything? Or how do I get someone else to manage it? And Gary and, and Frederick, both of you are managers. I, I'm wondering if you can kind of take up that question. Uh, it's more expensive than traditional management. Uh, prices that I've price checked in Michigan usually start around 20% of the the gross rents, and depending on where you're at, for example, in Traverse City, it starts at about 30 and can go up from there. Uh, there are places like the Double J Ranch where it's 50%. Uh, so management is much more expensive because there is a lot more to do. You're talking about daily contact with these people. You're talking about communicating with someone with Airbnb and most of these websites rate you based off of how quickly you respond to the uh, prospective tenants because a lot of times people won't just book. They will ask a question, you know, how close are you to this? Um, do you have access to something or other? Even if it's in your listing, they'll still ask you these questions. And, and is it the manager's re uh, responsibility at, to respond? At that point, it's the manager's responsibility. So there's a lot more customer touching. And then as well, when you're in a, a vacation rental, if there is a maintenance problem, you have to fix it immediately because when you have a long-term rental and there's a plumbing issue, okay, well, someone comes out and fix it over the weekend or something, you know, you're out for a day or two of your year that you're in the, in the property. If you're staying at a place for two or three nights, or if you're staying at a place for a week and the, the plumbing is down for one day, I mean, that's, I mean, that's a third of your stay or a seventh of your stay. And so you can lose a lot of respect on the community and you can get really bad ratings if you don't fix things immediately. So you're not paying the handyman contractors. You're sometimes, I mean, you're hiring out of the phone book the most expensive guy that will show up in the middle of the night and, and fix and, your property. And that's if you're managing yourself, right? It, both. Even, both. Even if you have a manager because, once again, I mean, I've got handymen that can do things really inexpensively, but they're not the type of guys that are going to wake up in the middle of the night and have the parts and be able to do everything. So if it's a vacation rental and there's a plumbing issue, I'm, I'm calling that name brand phone book plumber immediately to get it taken care of for you. All right. Frederick, uh, your yeah. thoughts on management. I mean, is it, uh, is it 
obviously you manage, so there's, yes. there's compelling reasons why, why you think people should, should hire a manager. Yeah, um, like Gary said, it, is, it can be an enormous amount of work. Um, you do have some guests who are just easy. You communicate, you book them, you let them know how to get in, and then they're there and they're gone. But then there's some who maybe not happy with um, the temperature in the home or they can't figure out how to turn your television on or they don't know how to stream Netflix or they need toilet paper. Uh, you know, So it is an enormous amount of time commitment to making sure that you're keeping this experience um, as, uh, as positive as you possibly can for your folks because again, you want that rating, you want them to come back. Um, so, and also, you know, Gary mentioned the uh, the maintenance items. If you do get that phone call in the middle of the night, you can't you can't wait. You've got to get somebody there. Um, but having someone, you know, with their phone by the side of their bed at you know twelve thirty at night on Christmas Eve, that phone call will come. So having unless you were ready to do that and in a position to do that on your own. You've got to have someone who's got the capabilities um, to handle your guests, because ultimately, if you don't handle it, it's going to affect your long-term profits in, the, in, these, in these units. And, and for those who would uh, prefer to manage on their own, what are mm -hmm. some of the mistakes you see being made uh, by, by self-management? Um, I'd say the biggest mistake is accepting anyone and everyone who wants to stay in your property. Um, you just can't do that because if you're not, if you don't get someone, who, I'll take you through my process a little bit. I don't necessarily let anyone book with me who hasn't booked with Airbnb before. Um, that doesn't mean I won't, um, but I like to know who's in my property, what I can reasonably expect from their behavior while they're in there. Um, and what that does is allow me to to make sure that I don't have any long-term problems. Because if I have a uh, even the slightest problem or a maintenance issue, I mean, typically I've got people coming, you know, leaving on Tuesday and someone coming Tuesday afternoon. If I rented to, a, let's say, a bunch of uh, younger kids who are on spring break and, you know, they leave at 11 o'clock in the morning, you know, my typical turnover time to get the place ready for my next guest is two, three hours. But if they've trashed the place, they've used all your towels, they've stained your sheets, you're you're looking at a five, six hour turnover and it's an added expense for your cleaning person. And now you're telling your incoming guests that, you know what, hey, I'm not ready for you. So that long term can affect your rating. So being very careful with who you let into the property is is paramount to to the success of that. So go ahead, Gary. Part of that, Airbnb allows both the the tenant and the host to rate each other. Uh, Airbnb's rating system is heavily designed, so even though it's a one to five stars, there's really only two ratings, which is five star and anything else. Uh, and they heavily penalize you for anything below a five star. Because of that, and because of that interesting dynamic, hosts don't want to be viewed as ungracious and Airbnb doesn't want it to look like there are bad reviews out there so if tenants complain a lot of times Airbnb will remove things so a common thing that most newbies don't understand is that if someone has been with Airbnb for a long time and they don't have any reviews it's not because they're a good tenant and you've had hosts that don't want to say anything it's because hosts they're not going to put anything below a five star because they don't want to get that reputation so someone without reviews is often someone who is a very bad tenant even it I mean just because they don't have reviews does not mean that they are good and doesn't mean that that you should rent to them there are some tricks like that that you need to know and understand about the community it is a different community and on the flip side if you're renting you need to understand that if you if you rate someone low, you know anything below a five, it's basically rating them a one. Um, there, there is no difference in the Airbnb community. So it really, it seems like the rating system is useless because it's it's skewed by all these other factors other than the quality of the stay. Hey, Clay, go ahead. Well, except that it forces everybody to think about what they're going to do. Like I said, it forces me to think about where I want to stay. Is it, yeah, I could stay at the cheapest place, but I might not like it, and then I might be compelled to give a bad review, and I don't want to do that. 
I also don't want to be reviewed bad, so it really forces me to be extra special. Most people say, I don't think the guy actually really even stayed here. That's what they'll say about me, because I'm very, very meticulous when I leave. I remake the bed, I do everything, so it looks like it did when I came in, uh, except for maybe a couple things in the trash can. But that's about it. I like to clean the place up, make it nice, so I think it's important. Um, you know, another thing to know from uh, from a tenant's or a user standpoint is like that first couple that I rented with, I had to go through a screening process, very similar to a tenant. I had to agree to get my credit report pulled and a criminal report pulled. So that was an option through Airbnb. So they knew in advance that who I kind of was, you know, so I suppose they could be comfortable with leaving me there in their place, you know, for the whole weekend by myself. But isn't that kind of a, a crippling experience to have to worry about what impression you're leaving behind when you stay at, at a place and what kind of rating you're going to give and what that's going to mean to you in the future i mean that it doesn't really bother me because I, I guess i like to consider myself to be a good guest um i'm not going to trash the place uh, I'm, not, I'm not i'm not you know so i don't, you I don't have my rock band yourself, anymore and i won't even talk to you about what we did to some hotel rooms so you know <laughs> i'm not in that stage of life anymore um i want my places to be nice and i like to leave them nice uh, so I like to support that idea because I love not paying double or more for the same kind of space in the same types of nice locations. Wouldn't it be nice if all the guests thought like that, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'm sure uh, not every guest is as clean right. and great as you. Um, Kim, you're, these are things you have to take into consideration as you're developing your, right. your vac uh, short-term vacation rentals. So uh, why don't you talk about that process a little bit? I mean, you're starting from an old property that you're converting. It sounds like you've already kind of midstream had to change your, your vision somewhat. Um, why don't you kind of take us through your process? Um, yeah, especially after Gary and, and this other, having, having a sit down with Gary and what he's gone through because he's ahead of me and we had started um, renovating ours and said you know we're gonna have to step it up even though it's gonna be probably more hunting and not as upscale you're so review based and like I said we're not gonna put them online until we are in great shape in fact I'm going to have people stay in them for free that I know are gonna give me an honest assessment after they stay in them for a night and say you know what Kim you should have this or this or this because um, Otherwise, you're not going to get the good review or this is what's missing. The other thing is I have to have all my ducks in a row or get a management company because just like they're saying, if something goes wrong, we got to take care of it immediately. We can't wait. If, um, you know, now we have to have somebody do laundry. Now we have to have somebody on call. So my cleaning lady who normally cleans at turns, I can't use her because that's one person. I have to have a company so they can be in there whenever is needed. And I don't know that from the beginning. How often are we going to turn these? And is it just going to be the weekends? Is it just going to be during the week? Is it going to be, are we going to have a bunch of, you know, we're trying to work in the minds of oh, a fisherman. I don't want fish cleaning inside these cabins, you know? So what are we going to do about that? So fortunately, I have a garage that we're going to try to put put a fish cleaning station in and make cute signs so that they're not bringing that stuff in or just snowmobile stuff. We have to have a parking area for their snowmobile trailers. All that kind of thing that just, it's a whole, I'm finding a whole different mindset on what I have to look at these properties versus ones we already had done for tenants. We're really gonna have to go in and step it up. Right. The furnishings, you know, what are they expecting? We don't have internet on that site. And it's very difficult to find. Yeah, Fred, um, Frederick, I just saw you make a face when she said that. Yeah. Tell, tell us what Kim needs to make sure she does to ensure her success. Uh, internet, <laughs> uh, tire ground Wi-Fi, ease of access. Um, I mean, everybody's got these, even your hunters and fishermen. So, um, you know, you, you know they're pointing to your phone for the people listening. Right, right, right yeah. Podcast. So. Yeah, you definitely need to have that. I mean, there, there'll be some folks who will come in and say, great, I don't need it. I'm on a hunting fishing. But, right. you know, the rest of us are like, right. you, especially if they bring their kids, you need to keep them entertained. And So inter Internet access. Um, Gary, what else should Kim uh, think about? I mean, when, when it comes to furnishings, just the quality, the level, you know, what are some must-haves if you're renting out a, a vacation rental? Snacks. 
Uh, I don't know why, but it's part of the Airbnb, air bed and breakfast idea. It's about the experience. So, I mean, even if it's just granola bars, something that you've stocked the property with a little bit gives it that extra, okay, this isn't just a place to crash. This is a, uh, it's part of the Airbnb community. I'm here staying in someone's home and they, they appreciate that kind of stuff. As I said before, a guidebook for the area. <laughs> Because there's a lot of common questions you're going to get, and people are going to want to know how to access Netflix. So you need a guidebook that says, here's where our Netflix is, here's how you enter in the codes, what our Wi-Fi code is. We have picture frames that have the Wi-Fi uh, password and name on them so that as soon as they walk in, they can see where this information is. Uh, you really just have to step up the, the resort feel the community feel it's those little touches like i said snacks and wi-fi and guidebooks and towels and toothbrushes the the little things that you might forget most people might not even ever use them because they don't want to use the toothbrush but you can buy on amazon basics you can buy a pack of you know 300 500 toothbrushes that come individually wrapped uh, that are good for a one or two night stay uh, so you need those little extra things to be stocked in your property yeah right and I, I see some hands. Do me a favor, because we are recording for the podcast. So go to the microphone, and uh, we'd, we'd love to take some questions. Hi. Uh, I've actually stayed at uh, Gary's uh, Airbnb up in uh, Whitehall. And it was Did a really you give good it a five? Um, I would. Uh, <laughs> he was, uh, they're still doing some renovations outside. I think they only had one or two rooms going at that time last year. Uh, but the room was really nicely appointed and uh, uh, bedding and everything else. It was a really nice experience uh, from all that standpoint. And uh, one of the things I wanted to ask uh, the other gentleman, too, was about the uh, key access and the lock access. Because Gary uses a, a, a Bluetooth uh, system from August, I believe it is. And I wanted to know what the other gentleman uses at his facilities as well. Sure. Um, I have used August uh, in the past. Um, actually, Gary and I were talking before we started about that technology. I mean, it can be fantastic, or it also could be an issue. Um, you know, it, some folks who are not all that technologically savvy have a hard time with the August lock. Um, sometimes, you know, if your property is an area you don't have any Wi-Fi or internet access, it makes it hard for a manager to manage that lock remotely. Um, we do believe in the future, as it, you know, the product gets improved based on all the user feedback, it's going to be a great, uh, it's going to be a great option. Now, what I do with the majority of mine are the simple um, code punch from Schlage locks. Um, it does take a little bit of extra maintenance, but I've got all of my uh, housekeepers and even some of my maintenance guys who know that when you turn the property over, the last thing that they do is coming out, coming out the door, is uh, strike the code from the last guest and enter a new code for the upcoming one. And it just takes a little bit of planning, but you know you have you know a schedule of what the codes are for each turnover. Everybody has it. They, and it just gets done as part of the cleaning process. Yeah, and, I, and I, I want to point out, too, that one of our sponsors on the podcast is uh, Point Central. And you can listen to their episode on, on uh, episode 98. But they, their, uh, their lock system is a, based on cellular technology. So you're not relying on Wi-Fi, which can go in and out every now and then. But it's cellular technology, which means you can access it from anywhere to change the code at any time. So I just want to point out Point Central. I just got a, an internet, or not, it's not internet, it's a Bluetooth, and I can text somebody a one-time code or an hour code or, you know, that it's good for an hour or whatever, and it, the batteries last every six months to change the battery. And at this point, I just got it about a month ago, and I'm using it for showings or maintenance and that kind of thing, and it's been great because... We don't, I don't have all, we had problems with people with other kinds of locks not being able to fit, work them and stuff. And um, we have a question here, Jacques, go ahead. Yeah, so I guess uh, we've talked a little bit about each of you have better or, um, suggestions, right? But mm -hmm. does Airbnb provide a guideline or uh, systems and maybe a, a community that you can share best practices in? There is a form that you can use. Yeah. It's yeah it's it's okay yeah 
I would say that information is, is kind of it's kind of sparse. Um, fortunately, I haven't had to access it that much um, to get any specific answers. But yeah, there, there's some resources out there. So. Right. And, and uh, so we, we're talking about Airbnb, short term vacation rentals. I mean, as if they're all interchangeable. Is one better than the other or like should people only consider Airbnb or are there other options? Uh, there's certainly other options. Um, most of my properties not only are listed on Airbnb, but I've gone the traditional route of VRBO or HomeAway or TripAdvisor. Although I have to say that um, if you ask me which to use three years ago, I would definitely say HomeAway VRBO. Um, but my Airbnb bookings are far surpassing the VRBO HomeAway at, at this point. And what do you attribute that to? Uh, I guess it's just the popularity of the app. It's much easier for owners and um, guests to use. It's, it's just more user friendly. And I, th I think the, the biggest attribute for Airbnb is that, I mean, you could be sitting on your phone right now and with a few thumb clicks, you could book a place. Um, home away VRBO is a little bit more, in, their processes are a little bit more involved where you, send an inquiry or ask for a quote and then you know the dialogue sometimes is back and forth in a couple days airbnb if you've got a host that allows for instant booking you can do it in a matter of minutes yeah from a user standpoint uh we've you know we've done all the vrbo and all those things before and for a while we would go to all those different sites to look for different things but we finally realized that there were being aver the same units were being advertised all across the board so why not just stick with one it's just easier to go to airbnb and do it and like was just said it's the app and everything's a lot more user friendly so currently airbnb has the better user interface also their product as i said is based not just off of vacation rentals but based off of travel so they have mm -hmm. places that are good for work for one you can stay at some places for one night where a typical vrbo or home away are week only or they are just the vacation so if you're going to be using this app to replace a hotel as an example you also get the option to go to vacation rentals and uh, stay at uh, unique locations or go on resort type places so because they've got more options it becomes an all-in-one inclusive place and i think their market share has drastically eclipsed the other ones at this point okay we have a question yes i was wondering about location which ones work best i'm sure if you're on a lake you know that's perfect or kim has a great idea with doing it up there in cadillac with the you know snowmobile and fishing um, can you just talk about the average guy that's got one in, t in a town and does that seem to be as profitable as maybe the one that you were talking about earlier, uh, Fred, or sure. how, how did that go? Sure. Um, well, you know, with anything with real estate, it's location, location, location. Um, you know, West Michigan and the Lakeshore, yeah, if you're near a beach, you're going to get people coming in. Um, but, you know, I've had some successes in some metro areas as well. Like when I first started doing this, I was doing it in Chicago, and it was greatly successful. Um, I mean, I'm sure folks travel back and forth to Chicago. I mean, hotels there are pretty darn expensive. Um, but if like what I would do is I would find nice apartments in nice, safe neighborhoods that were, you know, walking distance to transportation. And all of a sudden, I'm offering you know a two-bedroom, one-bath apartment with a kitchen and a bathroom, completely private, for 150 to 200 dollars a night. People were all over it. So you know, getting back to your question, you know, it's it's finding the location, finding a metro area where people are coming and going from um, business travelers, especially. Um, Gary's mentioned that you know it's. It, if you're going to be there for a week or three or four days for a conference such as this, you know, it's it's cheaper for your traveler, which makes this a great alternative to business travelers. So, you know, you're not just spending $200 a night in a hotel, but, you know, you're $20 at lunch. And if you're going out for dinner and drinks at night, now you're another 100 bucks. Um, but if you've got a place where they can come home, relax, you know, spend $15 at the grocery store for two, three days worth of their time, it's a much more finished uh you know, inexpensive option for, for travelers. What are the fees that Airbnb charges? So let me repeat the question. What are, what are the fees that Airbnb charges? I think they charge us between 2 and 3%, um, but they significantly tag on to your traveler. 
the, um, and I don't know what that percentage is, but it's 12. Yeah. Yeah. We have a question. Oh, first, a couple of comments. Have We've used Airbnb in Europe and in the United States, and it's been an awesome experience every time. One of the things that I would say is there's a lot of different travelers, and we all want different things. And so the way you describe what you have to offer is really important because, like, I look for ones where I don't want to meet the host. And I don't, I mean, some hosts want the experience of meeting their travelers and like that aspect if they're going to be in their home or something like that. But me, I'm there, I'm on vacation, I don't really want to meet the people. So I really look at the description to eliminate certain experiences because they're not me. Now, I don't know, you know, like Clay, maybe there's ex there are travelers who want that experience and will look for it. So it's really important to describe accurately because in the reviews, you'll see that someone will say, well, you know, this is what the description said, but this is what it really was. So you're much better off just being totally honest about what your experience is and your location, because then you will have people select you because that's what they're looking for. Um, but the question that I have is when I've traveled, like I was in, we were in Chicago and used an Airbnb uh, last summer. and. I've been wondering about, I'll bring up the subject, like bed bugs and things like that. Even hotels have issues with that nowadays. So how do you, how do you deal with those kinds of things? I mean, you, you can certainly select your traveler, but bed bugs are not a low income issue anymore. So I'm just kind of curious about how one deals with those sorts of things in um, Airbnb or short term rentals. Yeah, uh, Clay, let's, uh, I'm just curious. Let's start with you as a user of Airbnbs. Do you worry about bed bugs any more than you would um, with my hotels? my wife worries for me about the bed bugs? <laughs> <laughs> I, and I and I have had to find out how to uh, investigate some of the places we stay to look for. So before we'll set anything down in the room, I have to go in and pull mattress stuff apart. You know, check around the bed, look for the telltale signs of those kinds of things. Um, I then find then myself you call down to your wife and say it's okay. Yeah, to I just you know I'll let her know it looks it looks great to me, and so far I've been right. Thank God. Mm -hmm. And from a management perspective, I mean, have you dealt with bed bugs at all? Uh, unfortunately, yes. One of the properties I, I operated in Chicago, I got a I got a, a checkout message saying, "Hey, thank you very much. The place was great, but my wife woke up this morning with a couple bites on her feet. You might want to check for bed bugs." And I immediately panicked. Um, Went to the property, investigated, and found that yes, I one of one of my bedrooms did in fact have bed bugs. Um, how did I deal with it? Um, I I basically scrapped the room. Um, so I had a I it was a double bed. So I got rid of the mattresses, the wood frames, um, the curtains, the carpets. I mean, basically, I, I striked the room. Um, had it fumigated um, and then you know replaced everything um, but that was that was a learning experience for me it was one of the first ones that I'd ever done and that bed in particular when I put it together I did not use a bud bed bug proof or resistant mattress pad so you know for all of you Airbnb ears out there any one of your beds you know invest the 50 to 75 dollars for the best you know, mattress protector that you can to help alleviate that problem. Because maybe if you've got a small couple travelers in there and if you catch it soon enough, you can come in and fumigate and get rid of all your linens, et cetera, et cetera, and you should be fine. But once those little guys get into the mattress, it's, it's game over. Wow. All right, we have time for one more question here. Go ahead. Yeah, my question has to do with uh, the compliance requirements mm -hmm. as someone speaking who has no experience yet of operating a B and B but wants to step into it. Um, state level compliance requirements or city level. Um, what can you what can you share with us more specifically, say the city of Grand Rapids, if you have any input on that is um, I'm, I'm looking heavily to start something in Grand Rapids and I don't want to with good intention step into it and realize that maybe I'm not in compliance with local ordinances sure um right now grand rapids is not very airbnb friendly 
Um, their ordinances are almost really prohibited. Um, base level, the way that the ordinance reads right now is if you want to operate a short-term rental in one of your properties, um, the property has to be owner-occupied, meaning that you, you have to actually reside on the property and you can only rent out one of the bedrooms in that home as an Airbnb. And then above and beyond that, there is a county and state tax. Uh, mm -hmm. It's a use tax. So it's some, depending on where your county is, it usually ends up being around 11, 12% total. Airbnb will collect for the state of Michigan and there's a lot of other states that they'll collect for. They don't collect for the counties yet. So at the end of the year, you're, when you're doing your taxes, you're gonna have to pay a, an extra tax on top of that for the, your local county. And in addition to in Grand Rapids, they, lim <coughs> excuse me, they limit the number of Airbnbs within a certain block. So I don't know how they track that. How, I assume they must have somebody going to Airbnb every day looking uh, to see if somebody's doing that um, with, in order, I guess, opposed to keep parking problems down, things like that. Yeah. And every city is different. We've got North Muskegon and on the coast here who they completely outlawed it. And then you've got Muskegon who came in and said they haven't passed it completely yet, but all of the... Uh, city managers and people that work at the city moved into vacation type areas and then got really upset that there are vacationers there. So they are <laughs> requiring the same inspections as a normal rental, but they're trying to increase the expense from $70 a year to $500 a year just to discourage it. Uh, and then you've got Grand Haven as an example. In Grand Haven, the township allows them. Grand Haven proper does not. So you really have to check with your city, your county, and your state to find out all the different rules and regulations that are involved in this. Um, and you need to look at the laws on bed and breakfast as well, depending on what you're providing. Uh, there are different loopholes you need to per need to jump through. As an example, in a vacation rental, someplace where someone's not gonna live for more than a month, you're not supposed to use round knobs. Uh, it's in some places, I haven't checked everywhere, but. Uh, it's considered a fire hazard. You have to use something that's a lever because someone who's not familiar with the area might not have the grip strength to be able to get out if there was a fire. So there are things that you might not know about. Uh, your insurance is also different. So you really do have to do some investigation before you start. My fear is that uh, Airbnb, I rent to somebody and they don't move out. You don't have a way of evicting. How do you get rid of somebody who won't leave? So, okay, so I'll repeat the question. Uh, what if you have squatters? What if they, they come to stay and never move out? What do Pol you do? Police, uh, they don't have any tenant rights. They haven't lived there long enough. You call the police and right. they, um, they kick them out. That. Right. Yeah, the police have authority. It's, it, it's considered defrauding an innkeeper because at some point, again, what Gary mentioned, um, um, there's no tenant rights which is what you know we yeah. as property owners you know we've those laws are pretty you know tenant oriented but um at, at this point you know if if someone doesn't leave they're they're considered defrauding an innkeeper and yes you can't call the police fortunately i've never had that opportunity uh, you know once in a while i get people who check out late um but nobody who's ever checked in for good this okay. is one of the advantages of Airbnb. There's a there's a movement because, like I said, I'm really focused on this now, listening to podcasts and looking to see what conferences and different things. There's there are a lot of people who have been in Airbnb and they complain about the rates. But this is one of the benefits of Airbnb. Their screening process. They have liability insurance that covers some of this stuff. The and I think you you have a much better tenant by going through, or not a tenant, a much better uh, resident for that time period than just renting your room on Craigslist. I think Airbnb um, takes care of a lot of that stuff. And yes, you can call the police. I have talked to them about this and they will get them out. It's a totally different, a totally different rule than what it is for just like Gary and, and Fred said, long-term okay. tenants. So we pretty much run out of time. Clay, do you want to have the final word? I really don't <clears throat> have any extra to add, except that it's a, it's a phenomenal experience for the user if it's done well, and I think it's going to be a phenomenal experience for the owners. Great. So I want to thank our, our panel here, uh, Gary, Frederick, Kim, and, and Clay. Thanks so much for sharing your, uh, your expertise with us. Give them a round of applause.
This episode was sponsored by Green Property Management, managing everything from single-family homes to apartment complexes in the West Michigan area. Find out more at greenpropertymgt.com. You've been listening to the Rental Property Owner and Real Estate Investor Podcast, brought to you by the Rental Property Owner Association. You can find out more at rpoaonline.org. If you enjoyed this podcast, please go to iTunes to subscribe, rate, and review. 